Yeah, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Today's um, presenter is John, John Walker. And, and John Walker is a linguist, consultant, and a lexicograph specialist with SIL, Tanzania. He has been involved with producing dictionaries, products in various Bantu languages, specifically in Mara region. Related to this work, he is also interested in the historical and comparative linguistics, etymology, and language change. And today, uh, John Walker will be presenting about practicing lexicograph in the Mara Bantu languages of Tanzania, methodology and tools. So we are all here, John Walker. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Simon. So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Johnny Walker, so I uh, usually publish and present under my more official name, John B. Walker. So if you see that, <laughs> that's the difference there. But most people call me Johnny. Um, I'm going to be talking today about practicing lexicography in the Mara Bantu languages of Tanzania, the methodology and tools that we use. Um, and as Simon mentioned, I work with SIL Tanzania. So to explain a little bit about SIL Tanzania's work in the Mara region of Tanzania, um, in 2006, we did the first survey of the languages um, and gauged the similarity between them to, to make decisions about which language groups we were going to be focusing on in the, in the region. Uh, the following year, we started developing partnerships in the region and specifically deciding where to focus work. And originally, that was with eight language groups in the Mara region in Tanzania. And around the same time, work began uh, with looking at the phonology and grammar in these languages. So we held workshops for that. Uh, we translated a 1700 word list. Uh, from Swahili into these languages and uh, started making some initial orthography decisions about how to, to write the languages. And that was done working with, with native speakers of each of those languages. And from that time forward, we were um, working to develop the orthographies further in conjunction with the communities. Um, we developed literature of various types. Uh, as a lot of SILs focuses on religious literature, but also developed some health um, literature, traditional stories, and, and various things like that have been produced over the years. I've also been able to do some uh, audiovisual material, uh, like translating some videos uh, into the local languages. As part of the process of, of working with the communities, we've developed language committee, committees, which are now known as CBOs or community-based organizations. So they're the main contact point we have with the language communities through these committees. And they're um, helping us to, to make the decisions as we move forward with, with different plans for the projects. So in 2014 is when we actually when I started work with with dictionaries in the uh, in the Mara region, and over from then until now, have been working mainly with three groups in Mara region. Um, also had a couple of other projects outside of the Mara region, but they haven't been as as large scale as the ones in the Mara region. Um, so the the Kabwa language is the one that has been fully finished, and there's a full trilingual dictionary um, with listings in all three languages. And I'll talk more about that later. And we also uh, have been working with the Kizu Sizaki, which are two, two dialects of one language, and they're very, very close. Um, there, there might be some um, you know, cultural differences between the two groups, but their languages are very similar. And the Komanata, um, as well, those are two dialects. Uh, they have more variation than Ikizu and Sizaki, but they're still fairly, fairly closely related. And we're about to 
to launch the first mini dictionary from, from that project here in November. So to give you an idea about what the Mara region looks like, first of all, within Tanzania, this is the region here um, up with Lake Victoria on the east. And then, as you can see, the Serengeti ecosystem with all the game reserves and the park kind of surrounds the Mara region on the, uh, sorry, this is the east and the south of the region, Lake Victoria on the west. Um, so there are a lot of of little language groups in the Mara region. Uh, they're mostly Bantu groups, but there's also Luo, which is Nilotic up here, and then also Taturu, which um, another name for a Datoga group that's down here in the south. So they're another Nilotic group, but a, a separate branch of, of Nilotic. But all the other groups and lines you see here on this map are, are Bantu groups, and they come from two main um, sections of the Bantu Bantu groupings. So there's JE25 over here with Jita, Ruri, and Kwaya along Lake Victoria here. And then all the other groups are part of JE40. Um, so specifically wanted to highlight the groups that we've been working with with dictionaries. The Kabul are up here, uh, fairly close to Musoma. This is where Musoma is on the map. And then we have Ikizu and Sizaki right next to each other here, and Nata and Ikoma out over here. Of course, when you're starting a dictionary project, one of the main things you have to be concerned with is how you're going to get the words for the dictionary. Uh, so word collection is what how we refer to that. And um, with major world languages these days, the main way that word collection happens is through a uh, a large corpus, textual corpus of, um, you know, millions and millions of words worth, worth of text. And the data is just gathered by seeing how those words fit with other words, um, how they collate with other words around them. And, and you can gather the meaning uh, just seeing that over and over how those words fit within the larger picture of the grammar and the sentences. Um, but those larger languages have have huge resources um, that they're able to use to develop those corpuses and and that wasn't going to be a possibility uh, for our our projects uh, where we didn't have the finances or the resources to develop a corpus like that. So um, and that's the second bullet point down there. Another possibility for a way to gather words is by translating word lists. Um, from another known language. Uh, in the case of working in Tanzania, Swahili is, is the language that you would translate from. And we did, at the beginning of the project, we gathered a 1700 word list from Swahili and put that into a Flex database. Um, but we wanted to gather a lot more words than just those 1700 words and, and felt like that was possible. But with word lists, there are a lot of limitations uh, for one, if you're translating from a word list, you have one word in Swahili, and it could have multiple possible words in the vernacular language that are associated with that, but you'll generally only get one response if you have one word in Swahili, uh, one response in the vernacular language. And so it limits the, the amount of, of words that you can collect. So considering these specific uh, challenges with word collection. There's been a, a method that's been developed uh, by a man in SIL named Ron Mo. He developed a word collection method that's based on semantic domains. So uh, similar to how the mind makes connections between related things, um, if we gather words within a semantic domain, an area of meaning, then people can connect one one word to to the related words around it, and you can gather words in a in a much quicker way than you can translating from word list. And so that's kind of the theory behind the the semantic domain word collection, and that developed into something that we call rapid word collection. Um, so it's it based on a questionnaire. In our case, it's been translated into Swahili, but the questionnaire has been translated into other LWCs as well. 
um, for use in different parts of the world. And the questionnaire is organized in a hierarchical system of semantic domains. So there's nine macro domains. These are the largest level domains, and they cover large areas of, of meaning. So for instance, number one here, universe creation. Area two is person. Area three, language and thought. Area four, social behavior. And uh, macro domain number nine, all the way down to number nine, which is grammar. So um, each of these macro domains consists of many subdomains underneath it that get more and more specific as you go down the tree. Uh, and within each domain, you can gather specific words connected to that. So at the larger level macro domains, you're looking for the big words that that encompass the whole idea of that that area of meaning. And then as you get more and more specific, you can focus on um, very, more and more compact ideas of, of meaning that are related to each other. And you'll notice here also in this that each of the domains is given a number. So at the highest level, they're given just a single number, one, two, three, four. Um, if we go to the next slide here, each of the macro domains is subdivided into more and more specific domains for a total of around 1700 domains. So within the macro domain number two for person, if you go down one level, you're, you're looking at a, a semantic domain for the body is 2.1 and then 2.2 .2 would be body functions and it continues down from there. There's a 2.3 and a 2.4, but even within this, domain 2.1, there are subdomains under that. So you have 2.1.1 for head, 2.1.2 for the torso, 2.1.3 for limbs, and it continues. And just to show that it can go down several levels, you also have here uh, two point under head, there's other subdomains specifically for like eye and uh, nose, things like that, that could have a lot of words connected with them especially as you get to thinking about the senses um, that you use connected with seeing and, and with uh, smelling and things like that. So that's kind of an idea of the structure of the, um, of the semantic domains. Now, a lot of the resources for the semantic domains are up online. So you can check this out afterwards if you're interested, but there's a site called rapidwords.net and um, the resources have been translated into a number of, of larger languages. So they're, they're useful in a, in a variety of areas around the world. Um, and this, this continues to be added to uh, into the future, but check that out if you're interested. This is a, a shot of part of the questionnaire that I mentioned. This is the semantic domain questionnaire that uh, is the core part of the rapid word collection workshop that we that we have run in the past. So, for instance, within domain 2.1 for the body, there's a general heading that says what the domain is meant to be uh, dealing with. And then there are several questions under each domain. And even some of the domains have up to 20 questions in them. Uh, so there can be a lot of questions there. So there's a question here in, in the domain 2.1 body, for instance, you get what re what words refer to the body. Uh, second question, what words refer to the shape of a person's body? What general words refer to a part of the body, et cetera. And within each question, since this is the English questionnaire, there's even uh, suggestions for what types of words could fit within or could answer these questions in English. So um, in English, then we get all these uh, words that fit within a specific domain. And so for every domain, all 1,700 of the domains, there is a questionnaire associated with it, specific questions. So for the rapid word collection, the traditional setup for the workshop, uh, several months in advance of an actual workshop, uh, things are arranged with a language committee, which we're now calling a CBO. So the language committee has contacts on the ground in these language communities, and they know they can identify the people that would be uh, good to be involved in, in an activity like the rapid word collection. 
they can help to organize the, the venue and some of the logistical details connected with that. So we've worked through the, the language committees to, to set up the rapid word collection. Uh, when we start, we do three days of training prior to the start of the actual word collection. And that is specifically for some of the more involved roles within the workshop so that they really have a good idea about what they're doing uh, during the workshop. So when the workshop actually starts, it's a two week workshop and generally have six table groups of between four and six people in each group. And in each of those table groups, there's a leader who's directing the work. There's a scribe who's writing down all the words that are collected and the other members of the group are language experts who can contribute words um, to to each of the semantic domains. So each group is given a packet with a por portion of the domain questionnaire in it, and that's usually seven to 15 related domains. And the group will fill out response sheets listing all the vernacular words words and when I say words, I'm also talking about idiomatic phrases as well. So it's not just individual words, but we want them to, to collect idioms as well um, that could be more than a single word. And this happens in each specific domain that they're given. So when they finish a packet, it's taken onto a record, record keeper who has a, a spreadsheet on their computer and they're keeping track of all the words that are collected they'll they'll then hand on another packet to the to the table groups and the table groups will continue collecting words but the record keeper will enter the number of words that have been collected in each of the domains and then they'll pass that packet of domains on to the glossers and there's a group of glossers sitting in a different part of the room or even potentially in a separate room depending on how the venue is set up and those four to six glossers will translate from the vernacular into uh, an LWC, which in our case was Swahili. So I wanted to show while we're thinking about it, this is what the, the response sheet looks like. So as the groups are going through an individual domain, there's a slot up here where they can write in the, the domain number and the name of the domain, the name of the person, who, the scribe who's taking the words down. Um, this is actually an edited version of the, the response sheet. There's generally some more information on the upper right side here, which include like the group number. You can give, give each of the groups a number and then um, a little checkbox for the record keeper to keep track of which uh, domains they've already counted in the spreadsheet. And this column here on the left side is the slot for the vernacular words. And so they will uh, as the group goes through it, they'll be listing the words over here on the left side. And then after it gets passed on to the glossers, they will list those on the right side over here, the translations. So that's what the response sheet looks like. Um, so as the glossers are doing their work, they can support each other in the translation, but they also have the information about which group actually collected a specific word. So if they have a question about it, they can go back to that group and ask specifically about that word if it's something unfamiliar to them. Um, after the glossers finish a packet, they take it back to the record keeper who makes note of that and then hands it off to a data entry specialist. So there's usually a group of four to six data entry specialists and they each have their own computer they enter the vernacular words and phrases with their translations into the Flex database. Um, the Flex database has already been set up prior to the workshop and it's ready to receive information. Also, the, um, the Flex, Flex itself has a tool inside it called Collect Words that helps in the process of, of running a rapid word collection workshop. However, there are even better tools available now and i'll talk about that a little bit later on uh, for for actually running the rapid word collection workshop uh, but there's a process of in the traditional setup with flex there's a process of merging the different versions of the database so for instance you have one person on their computer entering things uh, another person on a different computer entering different things from different domains so a couple of times a day, we'll, we'll do a 
send receive with a USB drive and pass that around to all the computers until they're all updated. And then you have an authoritative version, but that process does take a bit of time each day to do. Um, and so I'm glad to see that there's, there's new ways of entering words for the rapid word collection now. So this is a two week period of time that the rapid word collection happens. And most of the domains can be finished in that time. Uh, in my experience, we haven't been able to get on to macro domain number nine, which is about grammar, but generally you wouldn't expect to find as many lexical items in that domain anyway. Um, so that can be done after the workshop if you're really curious to know uh, more about specifically about grammar within the language. So after the workshop, the data editing begins, and this is really the bulk of the work for the dictionary. Uh, the data from the RWC is in a very raw state is what I call it. There's a lot of, of repeat entries uh, that need to be merged together. There, people were in the groups were probably doing their work fairly quickly, and there might be misspellings in the data. Um, so those kind of things need to be checked. Uh, so following the workshop, we generally have one week with a small group of participants that stay together after the workshop. So generally, they were involved in the word collection, and a small group of them stays behind to, to help with the, uh, the, the cleanup week, we call it. So they make any immediate changes that they see as they go through that, correcting misspellings. If there are any inappropriate glosses that aren't accurate, then they'll make changes to those and possibly identify merges of similar entries that can be made. Following that cleanup, the linguists then start sifting through the data. And this does this is years of work, especially with the number of, of staff that we have available to work on it. It's, it's not a small task. I was encouraged several years ago when I read a book about dictionary making, and it talked about how in uh, these publishing houses would structure their their dictionary making tasks, and they have like six different departments for the different types of work that are that go into making a dictionary. And I thought, yeah, we do most of those <laughs> in our work. We're we're pretty much all of those departments put into one. So. Um, yeah, it just goes to show that it is, there's a lot of work going into making a dictionary and, and it, it does take a long time. Um, so sifting through the data after the workshops involves going back to the community. Uh, the, the linguists are trained in Bantu languages and know, um, you know, when they, they see something in an entry that doesn't really make sense, they know to go back and ask questions. So there's lots of sifting through the data that goes on in, in communication with the community into the future. And that in, includes adding English glosses to all the entries, because you'll remember in the workshop, we just had the vernacular and the Swahili. The communities that we work with is in the Mara region, but I assume more broadly in Tanzania, they really want trilingual entries um, in their dictionaries. And so having the English added is important to them. And so we, we work on doing that. There's also reversal indexes that are created from the data, and Flex does help with this task. So for instance, not only is there a vernacular Swahili English portion of the dictionary, which lists all the words in the vernacular in alphabetical order, there's also then a reversal index for Swahili to the vernacular and another reversal index for English to the vernacular. So it's essentially like three, three dictionaries put together in one. Um, but any user who wants to look specifically for an English word to see if there's a word in the vernacular, they would use um, the English index then to search for that word. And that does take a lot more work than it actually sounds like, because if you just take the glosses from the um, from the vernacular, you know, the, the vernacular words were given glosses in Swahili and then eventually English glosses for those words as well but that um, those glosses aren't necessarily the way you would want the, the term listed in a, in a dictionary. And so when you're doing the reversal index, you actually have to think about how that should be listed in a dictionary um, list. And so that takes a bit of work as well. 
and takes time. So I've mentioned that we make big use of the flex program in our work of, of dictionary editing. And uh, I think most people are probably familiar with that flex, but in case you aren't familiar with it, this is a screenshot of what the, the main area that we use in, in dictionary editing. This is the lexicon edit area of, of flex. And so it lists under entries here on the left side, it lists in alphabetical order all the all the entries in the vernacular. Um, but you can organize this by different fields. So there's a lot of uh, possibility to sort by different different sorting. If you wanted to list by the English glosses, you could do that as well, you know. So uh, different ways to sort the data on that side. And then when you click, for instance, Eriguha here, I've I've clicked on that entry. And it shows up on the right side over here, more specific details about that entry. And so we can enter a lot of data. There's a lot of different fields that are available here for different types of linguistic data that can go in there, uh, including towards the bottom, you'll see sense one there with the Swahili and English gloss of the word. Um, and then up at the top of the entry part, you'll see uh, what is called a dictionary preview. And this is actually how the entry is going to appear in the dictionary. So um, for instance, it says eriguha and the plural form amaguha, and then that it's a noun and with the glosses into Swahili and English following that. So that's a basic entry in, you know, this is Kabwa, the Kabwa language, and that's how it would look in Flex. So after all the editing has taken place by the linguists, there's one final checking step that we go through. We take the printouts of the fully edited dictionary into the community again for a final checking session uh, with a group of, of editors in the community. Um, and that that was a, a really encouraging event when we, we did that with the, with the Kabwa. Um, I enjoyed working with the community on that and they were excited to be getting close to having the dictionary in their language and, and really involved in that process. After that editing goes, then we're developing the front and back matter for the dictionary, like the introduction, acknowledgements, user's guide, list of abbreviations, a short grammar sketch, uh, things like that that could be useful to the user of the dictionary uh, when they actually go to use it. Um, we start working through any data formatting issues with a typesetter and also develop the front and back cover and title page that will go into the uh, into the final dictionary. And after all of that's put together into a final typeset draft, then we work with a publisher to get the dictionary printed. And it finally gets delivered out into the community. The goal is to have both the dictionary in the online format and, um, and also a printed format. Long-term goal is also to have sound files with the online dictionary. And so with the original 1700 word list that we were we recorded those terms and so we have at least you know a thousand plus words in the database that are that have sound files connected to them and so those can be added to the online dictionary as well so this is the online what the online dictionary site that we use is called webinary.org this is just a, a snapshot of of what a page of that looks like in uh, the Kabwa Swahili Eng English Dictionary. Um, you'll see those, those entries look similar to what we saw in Flex. Um, and so it's, it's putting out all that, that, we, uh, that we entered into Flex. So there's an there's a interface between Flex and Webinary where you can just export the dictionary from Flex into Webinary. And um, that makes it really easy to, to do that. And then, of course, I mentioned the actual physical dictionary, which the people love to receive in their own language. So this is from the the dedication with or the the launch event with the uh, with the Kabwa community. You'll see over here on the left what the actual cover artwork looked like and the cover for the dictionary. And then on the right, um, the the spot for the the special guests behind the speaker there, uh, which is a normal Tanzanian custom. And also down below a uh, picture of the table where we were selling dictionaries to people in the community. Uh, on the left here, there's a man who 
had helped us out with the word collection and was looking at the printed dictionary for the first time. So I really enjoy that picture, seeing him get to look at that. And then as is the custom also with uh, Tanzanian gatherings, there was a choir that sang that day at the, at the launch event. And here on the right, uh, we gave, we gave uh, complimentary copies of the dictionary to those who had been really helping us throughout the process. And um, so this, this was a picture of me actually giving a, a dictionary to one of our partners there. So I mentioned earlier on that there have been some recent, more recent modifications in how rapid word collection is done. And so I wanted to highlight those um, now. So one of the things we're trying now is to work with a reduced workshop size and for the word collection to actually take be, be held over several years rather than all at once. And so the, the motivation for this was that, uh, as I mentioned before, when you do all the word collection all at once, you get a lot of raw data and it takes a long time to sort through it. And while you're sorting through all that data, you are have less connection with the community. So we we felt that doing a a smaller workshop um, once a year every for three years essentially, so three separate workshops with a year in between each of them, that we could have a prolonged contact with the community um, during that time, and and also potentially reduce the the workload after a single word collection event um, to to make it simpler to to get the the data processed. So for instance, we've uh, been working with the Ecoma and Nata and we've been trying this new approach. Uh, round one of the word collection happened last year in July and August, and we were focusing on macro domains one, two, and five for that. Rather than all nine macro domains, we were just focusing on three of them. So it involved 13 people instead of the traditional 35 to 45 people. Um, but we could really be specific about the participants that we invited and get the get the best of the best who would be the most helpful in the process. And so I feel like we had a really good group of people with the Yakoma and Nata word collection and that that showed and they were able to um, finish in essentially three weeks time, they finished those macro domains one, two, and five. And so that was that was great. The first mini dictionary has now been been published. Um, we're hoping to launch that in the community in November this year. Um, and so Nora, who's on the call today, and I will be going back to the Ecoma and Nata to run the second round of work collection. But immediately prior to that, we'll launch the first um, mini dictionary for the Ecoma, pe Ecoma and Nata people then. And the the focus of round two word collection will be macro domains three, four, and seven. Um, but part of the re another reason for publishing this mini dictionary first is that it will actually uh, we're hoping we're calling it a trial edition of the of the dictionary. We're hoping that it will get out into the community and people will already be able to engage with the data, even now, even before we've finished the complete dictionary. And they can give us feedback already on that. Essentially, if they notice errors in the text, they can let us know about those. Um, so it continues the editing process, but it also gives the people um, already a resource, uh, something that they can have in their hands and look at. So I'm excited about this, this new process of word collection. Another thing that has come up recently is the introduction of a program called the Combine. And this allows for real-time world word collection. So if you'll remember before with, with Flex, you had to have essentially separate copies of the database on each computer that was doing data entry. And it, those computers would have to sync together several times a day in order to, to get all the changes that had been made. But now there's we can do real-time word collection through the Combine. It's accessed either online or through a local network that all the computers at the workshop connect to. And the changes are seen in real time, so they don't require any syncing between machines. 
what this allows for is a new way of actually doing the word collection uh, because it can happen at the same time as collecting words and glossing. There's no slowdown in that. And so now the, the pattern is to have with together with the table group um, that's collecting the words, there's also a glosser there at the table and there's also the data entry person at the table. Um, so everybody's sitting together and they can enter the words in dir directly into the computer and the glosser can actually see, you know, as the words going into the into the computer, how it's being written. If there's an error made, it can be caught right there on the spot. Um, so this really helps with reducing the number of errors in the data. And there were some thoughts that maybe doing it this way would actually slow down the word collection, but in practice, that hasn't been the case. Uh, in practice, it's been about the same speed as doing it the traditional way. So that's really encouraging. I have not actually used the combine in, in a workshop setting yet. I've used it outside of a workshop, but I'm, uh, I'm excited that within the, well, in November, we'll get a chance to do that with the Coma and Nata and using the combine for the first time. So excited about that process. Wanted to show you some screenshots of that so you get a feel for what this app looks like. So it's accessible online. Like I said, you have to create a username and, and password, but the, the website is the combine.app if anyone is interested in, in looking into that more. Uh, and it interfaces with Flex. So after you get the data in the combine and you're done with the workshop, you can just export it all into Flex and then have that available in the database after the workshop. So there's essentially two sides of the, the work that you can do in the combine. You have data entry and data cleanup. And I'll talk about the cleanup in a second, but the data entry is organized very nicely by semantic domain and in a hierarchical tree structure. So you can go into the subdomain that you want. And um, once you click on a specific domain, you can just start typing in the words in the vernacular and um, and put the glosses in right right next to them with them. So it's it's very simple to, to run the use the program. Another benefit of the combine is that there are some data cleanup tasks that are included with the program. And so, for instance, you can merge similar entries. It will automatically flag similar entries. So in this case, there's the word obokiri. And you can see in the, on the first card over here, the meaning unyama zifu. But then another card that had obokiri uh, associated with it with the meaning ukimia, and those are, are synonyms in Swahili. So I know that actually those two obokiris are the same entry. So what I could do is drag this card from the second obokiri into the first one, and it would combine the entries automatically. Even before the data goes into flex, those two entries are combined, and you can work with the, the data like that. You know, it also has the power to combine um, separate senses or essentially as I drag this over, it gives me the option to list it as a separate sense of Oukiri or combine it with the sense that's already there as a, as a direct synonym. So those decisions can be made on the ground. Essentially, once the words are have started being collected um, and if there's an extra person available, they can start working on the data cleanup tasks because the, the computer, the program will start prompting them with the tasks that need to be done. So it really does speed up the cleanup process of the data. In addition to this new format with the data entry, entry we've also hired two community workers who are native Acoma speakers, and they're instrumental in the process as we, we work with this new format because um, Myself and Nora and others who are working with the with the data back in the office later on, if we have any questions, we have an automatic person in the community to go to um, and we have contact with them. They've been given uh, tablets that they can use in their day to day work. And uh, so we can get answers to questions pretty quickly uh, with that format and it's really working well. The community workers also are tasked with visiting several villages in the months following the workshop. So they'll go to one village one month, 
and then another village the following month and work through a portion of the lexicon that was collected in the workshop at each of those village visits. So um, they're directly working, continuing to work with the data as well uh, to, to make any suggestions for edits. And then those edits from the village visits are added to the Flex database, any corrections made, um, any linguists, dictionary editors who are looking at the data database can flag the potential issues and, and work with the community workers to get answers to those questions. And then we still have a final community editing event that's held prior to publication. So we, we still do go out for a week to process through all the data and see um, if there are any, any things that we can catch before publication. Uh, and as before, any dictionary formatting issues are sorted out in Flex prior to and during the typesetting phase. So things go forward. This is the recently published Ecoma and Nata mini dictionary number one which is focusing on the nature, people, and daily life domains, like I mentioned. And we're excited to officially launch that in the community in, Nova in November. Um, I did want to mention that if any of what I've talked about today is of interest to you, I've written more about the rapid word collection workshops that I held with the Kabo and Ikizu Sizaki languages um, in a recent chapter that was published in the University of Hawaii's LDNC special publication number 29 that is available online. There's a long link here, but um, yeah, you can you can contact me and I can get you that that link as well. So my email address is here, John underscore Walker at SIL.org. But thank you for listening today and I'd be happy to hear any comments or questions from you all. Can we start with the bone? Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, it's really a must feel great to get those dictionaries published. And I, as you say, I think having the the um, preliminary one makes people feel that sense of progress. I, I do have one question, which is uh, working on Hadza, I noticed quite often uh, the Kiswahili they used was not standard. And I'm wondering, if you encountered many instances of that and how you dealt with that in the dictionary, because you don't want to tell people, you don't want to say, oh, your Swahili is wrong. I mean, I'm not a native speaker either, but when it disagrees with what the standard dictionary says, how do you, how do you deal with that kind of situation? Right. Yeah. So there's several cases that I'm thinking of. Sometimes you'll actually get like a, a phrase as a translation into Swahili rather than a single word. And um, sometimes there is a single word that that would better fit that in Swahili. So usually I would just add the single word that is a good translation of that, but then keep the the phrase as parenthetical material after after the um after the word. So then you get both what they what the people originally had written for the Swahili there, but also the a more appropriate term, but it is possible to to have several glosses, uh, Swahili glosses for the same word. So you could use the the word that the the people themselves had given, but also include a more official word right next to it. Just separate them with a comma, you know. So you have both of those side by side as essentially separate words for the same same term. So, yeah. You. Yes, Dylan. Thanks. Yeah, very interesting. Just a quick one. I'm very curious about alphabetical order. Um, I think I spotted, were your verbs ordered according to stem initial vowel or consonant? Yeah. And were nouns, how were nouns done? And did you have kind of discussions with the community about how people would look words up? Um, I'm curious about that. Yeah, we, we did have a some discussions with the community about that, but we didn't find very many people who were literate with dictionaries and how they were used. So essentially they were a blank slate, like they were looking to us for how to format it, you know, rather than giving their own suggestions for that. Um, so I generally followed what has been done in at least several of the Swahili dictionaries, which does for verbs use the the stem initial um, letter to sort by, but for nouns, I know there are some Swahili dictionaries that still sort by the stem initial um, letter for nouns as well, 
but I felt that would be a little bit com more confusing for dictionary users. Verbs kind of make sense because usually when you get the, um, you know, the imperative form of the verb, it would be the stem initial um, letter anyway. So that makes sense to people. They can get that pretty easily. But for nouns, it's harder for them to grasp that the, you know, any prefixes are not how you would be looking up a word. So just stuck to keeping that simple for people um, to use. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question from uh, Shklok. Uh, what is the average number of items you collect before cleaning up and the average left of uh, when everything is done? Okay, yeah, yeah, good question. So I'd say between, for the raw data, between seven and 10,000 uh, lexical items is what I've seen. Uh, there have been other groups in West Africa, I think, that got up to like 15,000 lexical items um, collected in a two-week workshop, but that seems like an unreasonably or yeah, irregularly high. <laughs> so generally seven to 10,000, I'd say, but then after cleanup, it's probably more in the four to 5,000 range um, that you actually get out of the data. But you also have to take into account the fact that you've added sense information as well. So some of the um, some of the lexical entries that were separate have now been included as separate senses under another entry. And so that um, that is part of the final dictionary as well, the, the sense differentiation. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you find any dialectical differences and if and how do you treat this? Well, it's interesting that you asked that because this Nata and Ecoma project that we're working on now does have some dis differences and they're fairly systematic in general, but there are a few few words that are just different. <laughs> um, and so the way we've, we've been dealing with that is to actually list both. Um, if there's a separate spelling between Nata and Ecoma, we list both and then include a little dialect label to say whether it's from Nata or Ecoma. And if it doesn't include the label, then that means it's used in both in both dialects. Um, so yeah, that's how we've been dealing with that. It does make for a larger dictionary in the end because you're gonna have more entries that way. Yeah, we have another question from Nora. Do you think it would be worthwhile to add Swahil examples to Swahil semantic domain questionnaire? That's a good question there. There has been some of that done, uh, but I and a, a team that I was working with were actually responsible for developing the, the Swahili semantic domain questionnaire. And we didn't have a lot of time to, to put a lot of work into it. So it probably needs to be updated at this point and um, including the Swahili examples that, that could be useful to spark people's you know, ideas as they're thinking in their own language. So yeah, that's a good idea. The ideal situation is to actually have the questionnaire translated into the vernacular. That would be the best case scenario, but that would take such a long time to do that I don't know um, if that's realistic. Um, but obviously, if people are looking at the questions in the vernacular, then they're already thinking in their own language. They're not going through a translated language. That would be the best case scenario. As far as I see, um... I don't find any hand up or question or comment. Then thank you very much, uh, John, um, for making this talk. And thank you everyone for coming in numbers. And um, maybe before we go, I uh, would like to announce that we have our, another meeting on 2nd of October. And I will be listening to Federico Palette on ghost segments in sanguary nouns. So mark your calendar on 2nd of October.